your son Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. morning church family it's good to see you guys man it's good to be back I missed y'all um, I, I just want to cover something real quick um, it, I've been told it might be a little dark on me this morning you might see some some shadows and some things going on we've had some lights go out this morning and I just um, thought I'd take the the time to remind you that 12 months ago we uh, made the decision to invest in this space in the auditorium and and to really revamp it and uh, because of the chip shortages and some of the supply shortages that we're facing um, it's we were told 18 months and uh, so we reached out recently to see it's been 12 months since we've done it and uh, we've been told possibly very strong possibly August so um, just hang in there uh, we're right there I'm mostly just talking to myself right now hang in there Josh uh, it's it's gonna be okay um, so it's good to be back and and before we started this morning I just wanted to speak to how encouraging that you, you've been to my family and I as we've uh, taken time to rest um, I just got back from uh, taking two weeks off and it was awesome uh, I, I've never considered taking two weeks off, but, but Chris, uh, our executive pastor, talked me into it, and I'm glad he did. And, and I'm not really sure what the source of it is, but a lot of pastors seem to feel guilty about stepping away from their responsibilities in the church to go and focus solely on their first and most important ministry, their family. And it's a, honestly, if I'm confessing it to you, it's a guilt that I've carried often. In fact, there are even pastors that play the shame game here in this realm. It's, it's quite devastating. I've heard them brag about how they worked rain and shine with no time off for a decade. These, these young pastors, they got it easy. I never took time off. But these same people, they quote statistics about pastoral burnout, but shame those that schedule for intentional rest. See, church leaders, they do. They're, they're fearing. There's a lot of discussion that we're on the verge of a pastoral shortage. Yet we talk so poorly about any effort by a pastor to achieve balance in life in order that he may have longevity in ministry. Barna Group runs the numbers every year, and the latest numbers say that 42% of pastors have considered quitting full-time ministry within the past year. 42%. We have a problem. And that problem isn't because pastors aren't working hard enough. I believe it's because they aren't resting hard enough. Maybe, and I don't know where the shame comes in. Maybe they feel like guilty being gone from the body. There's needs always. Maybe they receive emails from those in the body, making them feel guilty for stepping away when they needed them. Or, or, or maybe this one scares me a little bit is maybe their discipleship isn't quite where it should be. And so their claim is, well, no one can do what I do. And that's a problem. Or maybe even scarier than that, maybe their identity is in the job instead of the one who gave them the job. They don't want to step away. See, for Jesus, though, the wilderness or a desolate place was, it was a much needed break. I mean, Jesus regularly escaped the noise and chaos of society to be with the Lord, just be with his Father. Jesus made time to, to give his full attention to the relationships that mattered to him the most. We see it early in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, very, very early in the morning, and if you're not a morning person, you can do this at any time. Um, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, I can hear the church gossips murmuring, where's Jesus? Oh, he, he went off to the hills to, to get away from the noise and pray and be with his father. Oh, really? Wow. What a missed opportunity. Because this person could really use Jesus right now. Seems kind of self-centered to prioritize his quiet time over the needs of others. If that's selfish, then I guess I'm selfish too. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I need time away to center on him. 
I need to step away from the frenzy so that I can open up my life, so that I can open up my heart and let him go to work here. I want to know him. I want to walk with him. I want to enjoy him. And believe it or not, day in, day out, whether it's ministry in the church or ministry outside the church, it can be easy to lose sight of the one who enlisted you for the fight. Now, the timing of this break for my family was from God. There's no doubt. My family's been going through a lot recently. My wife has been going through a tremendous amount of pressure in her family and dealing with so many different things. And, and so it's just good for her and I to just, just disconnect and just be there, be together, enjoy one another. Really cool, the vacation schedule also allowed me to step in and serve a need in my own family. I had a relationship that I thought would never be reconciled was reconciled over my vacation, and I'm just continuing to pray that the Lord continues to give me the words to, to say and speak so that the next relationship to be reconciled is her relationship with him. <laughs> and I'm praying for that. Yeah, amen. But you know how I knew it was time to come back? This past Sunday, when I was driving to pick up Madison from work, uh, I was preaching to myself in the truck. I know, I'm weird, I can't help it. but I was, just, I was just going at it, and I, I realized in that moment, okay, Josh, like, time to get back to work, <laughs> and so I just wanted to say thank you um, for, for your love and your support uh, during this time. Today, we're in week four of Matthew part two, and throughout this series, our focus is simple. We want to answer the question, who is Jesus? Now, we're all faced with a decision in life, right? We will either accept him or we will reject him. We will either call on the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, or we will mock the name of Jesus and live in our sin. Now, the simplest way that I can think to put this for you, and you may want to write this down for today, you will either reject Christ or you will reject yourself. Now, let's chat for a moment, all right? How many of you would say that rejection is fun? Okay. Okay. Everyone just got flashbacks of being rejected in high school, right? That girl you asked to prom, she said, no, it's fine, get over it, right? <laughs> Husbands, if, if you're looking for bonus points today, now would be a good time to turn and look at your wife and say, babe, I'd be rejected by a thousand women if it would lead me to you. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Cheese is good, fellas, it's good. Now, here, here's a good one. How many of you, let's see some hands here. How many of you are sitting next to a person that once rejected you? It's okay. It's okay. I, that, great. Let that be a lesson on persistence, though, for me, for sure. Why'd you two get married, right? Well, he wouldn't leave me alone. It's like, okay, well, right? Whatever works. I'm familiar with rejection. In fact, uh, while on vacation, my wife and I, we were reminiscing, and we were telling the kids of a story when she rejected me. Now, Kristen will tell this different than I will, so avoid her in the lobby today. <laughs> but here's the situation. Um, Kristen and I, we were dating, and things were getting pretty serious, and through a string of events, she, she found herself moving closer to where I was living at the time, right? And, but there was a gap in her, her living situation. She needed a place to stay. So I asked my dad if he was okay if she'd stay with him. And so we got it all worked out and got it all fixed. Now, I'm thinking this is a great opportunity to tell her how I really feel, right? After all, she's trapped, right? Not like she could run away, right? Like she got nowhere to go. So, so, so we're hanging out with family. Now, again, Kristen would tell you that she knew something was up. She knew something wasn't right. She's thinking I'm acting weird and nervous and, like, anxious. She, she needed, right, something from her purse upstairs. So she's heading upstairs, and so she tried to pull away and really get in and get out, right? Because she just, she thought I had something planned for her that she didn't want to happen, right? And so she didn't want to be caught alone with me. So she grabs her purse, and she turns around to leave the room, and boom, there I am. Right? And so I start, I start in, right? I tell her how much I appreciate her and, and how much I enjoy spending time with her. And then, and then I said it, Kristen, I love you. Right? So here I am, out on a limb, hanging on for dear life, knowing that, that my spoken love will either be embraced and reciprocated or it will be tossed aside like an old stuffed animal that didn't quite make the cut for the garage sale. Right? So she turns, she looks at me, and she says, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you? 
I, I didn't get you a necklace, babe. I, off, I put my heart on a platter for you. Thank you? And that rejection was awful. But I waited. I waited. And let me tell you, the best wait of my life, right? It turns out she did love me. She just didn't know it yet, right? right. But being rejected is scary, isn't it? And it's awful. Being rejected is it's intimate. And it, it can cut really, really deep. But see, I can, I can think of only one thing that's scarier than being rejected by someone else. And it's actually the thought of rejecting yourself. That's scary. Like, folks, the call to follow Jesus is radical. It's bold. It's scary. And some would say it's crazy. But you can't ignore what Jesus says to those seeking to follow him. He said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. But the question that never seems to get asked is deny themselves of what exactly? What does this look like? Because the truth is, folks, there are parts we shouldn't deny. Like the fact that each of us is unique and a wonderful creation. God has given us worth and value from him, right? That we shouldn't deny this. In fact, in Luke 10, it says that we should rejoice that our names are written in heaven. Like we should not deny this. And so there's not like a complete denial of self that Jesus has in mind here. Like the denial that should be evident in the life of a believer is not of your new self, but of the old self. It's our flesh, not our spirit, that is to be rejected, right? So the call on every believer is to join Paul when he says this in Romans 7. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, some people will show up and they'll try to say that Paul's telling his testimony here. This is not true. Paul's not telling about his condition before conversion. This is post-salvation, Paul, right here. He's still fighting it. Every believer's testimony should have similar claims, the loudest of which being this, I have nothing of worth to offer God. I have no case to present to God on my behalf. I have no defense. And since I know that there's nothing that I can do, there's no hope. But if I put my trust in Jesus, then all the things I couldn't do, he's already done on my behalf. I mean, we've been singing it in this place, folks. Like, he's put a ring on my hand and a robe on my back. Folks, when you're adopted into the family of God, you begin to take on the family resemblance. You do. Ephesians 4 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Folks, this is the self-rejection Jesus talks about. You aren't any more good now than you were before Christ saved you. Paul says in Romans 13, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. There's a shift. Like, uh, folks, a true believer just stops looking for personal gain and starts seeking kingdom gain. And Jesus makes it clear that the first requirement for entering the kingdom of God, look at it, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The humble, the meek, blessed are those that have been brought low. So when we pick up in Matthew 21, we see pretty quickly that not everyone receives Jesus' message of self-denial with cheers and changed lives. In fact, Jesus is trending in Jerusalem. He's drawing crowds everywhere he goes. People were singing his praises. They were calling him king. Sounds like a church service I'd want to be a part of. What about you? I love singing about the kingship of Jesus, but I'm singing it without an agenda. I can't say the same for these people. See, they didn't just want him to be king. They wanted him to be their king. Man, it's sad, but many of the people that cried out Hosanna as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem were the same people crying out, crucify him. I just want to pause here for a second. From massive crowds to just three of his dearest friends at the foot of the cross. That visual. I mean, doesn't it feel like we've gone on this same journey in America? 
That kind of feels like, like, like the last three to four decades in America, this, this church growth movement feels like the triumphal entry. <laughs> like floods of people coming out of their homes, coming out of the city gates to meet Jesus and welcome him into their lives. You got to wonder, were those people following Jesus or were they following the crowds? Because now the faithful churches seem to be standing alone defending the unborn, defending marriage, defending our children. Yet look around and you wonder, where did all the crowds go? Where's everybody at? See, it seems those who waved to welcome Jesus also waved goodbye when they realized that following him might cost them something. See, today we're covering the second parable Jesus gives in chapter 21. Now, keep in mind what has happened, right? He enters Jerusalem on a donkey. He went to the temple, right? He's flipping, overturning tables. He's driving out money changers. He's not making friends, right? And these religious leaders, they're challenging his authority in this chapter. They're trying to push him out. They're trying to discredit him. And so Jesus is responding to really a resistance campaign from the religious elite. Matthew 21 starting in verse 33. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So the crowd's totally tracking with Jesus here, right? You might be like, okay, what's going on? Look, many of the people listening were farmers, and they kept vineyards, and even if they weren't farmers, they knew all about it, right? It was just something you knew back then. And so, in fact, if you go with us to Israel in April, uh, near where Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem is the hill country in Judea, and it's steep hills, steep hills. And because it's steep, the hills are terraced. So terraced hills for miles. I think I, I got a picture. We got a picture up there. So step one in vineyard building, all right? Clear the stones and build a wall, right? And so now you have these retaining walls to hold the soil, right? Step two, build out a wine press so that when you grow the grapes, right, you can crush them and have that downhill flow and storage and, and have a reservoir and all that good stuff. Step three, you put in a watchtower, right? Because this is before your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, right? So, so you, you needed to defend your own investment, right? And so most of these places, they would eventually have a cistern where they'd gather water and you could drink from it and you could also um, uh, water the crop during the dry season and things like that just to maintain things and keep an eye on things. So in, in other words, while we have no clue about vineyards, <laughs> these folks got it immediately. Look at verse 34. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. So look, he sends more servants. Look what happened. Verse 36. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So Jesus, in rabbi fashion, asked the crowd a question. Look at this in verse 40. He says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? So Jesus tells the story asks a question, and lets the crowd draw their own conclusion. And here's what some in the crowd say. Look at verse 41. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Now that answer is dead on, right? Like if this happened in real life, that's, that's what the owner of the vineyard would do. Like if I owned a vineyard, I'd be smashing faces. Well, it's time for you to move on, buddy. I'm after the fruit. That's the whole point. That's why I built these walls. That's why I put up the watchtower. That's why I planted the grapes. That's why I hired help. I want fruit. So this parable is not all that difficult to understand. You see, the nation of Israel is compared to a vineyard several times throughout the Old Testament. And they would have heard this, right? They would have heard these comparisons of the vineyard in the synagogues all the time. The house of Israel is God's vineyard. So if you're sitting there listening to Jesus that day, you'd immediately be thinking to yourself, 
Isaiah 5. He's talking about Isaiah 5. Check it out. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. Sounded familiar? He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So the story starts off good. Looks like it could be a beautiful song being sung, right? This is a good day. There could be enjoyment that comes from this labor, but something unexpected happens. Instead of good fruit from these choice vines, it yielded stink fruit. So this is not a happy song. This is a sad song. But look at verse 3. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. Look at this. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Are you seeing it? He looked for justice. That's the fruit the Lord expected, but when he looked for it, he saw bloodshed. That's the bad grapes. That's the stink fruit. He gave them everything that they needed to produce good fruit, yet when he looked for that fruit, when he looked for righteousness, he heard cries of distress. So now, now we can hear this parable in Matthew 21 just like the crowd did that day. We have a landowner, and it's God. We have the vineyard, that's Israel. We have the tenants, those are the Jewish religious leaders who are questioning his authority at this very moment. We have the landowner's servants, right? Those are the prophets and the priests that stayed faithful to God and preached to Israel. And finally, we have the son, that's Jesus. And don't forget, we have the replacement tenants, the new tenants, remember? That's the Gentiles. Now, if you look at this, it's not hard to identify the problem, is it? Is the landowner the problem? No. He's taken every step to build the vineyard and establish the enterprise. It's all set up. You're good to go. Is the vineyard the problem? It doesn't seem so. After all, choice vines were used, and it, re it yielded a harvest, right? Right? The servants seem to be trying. I can't see anything there really that they're at fault. Uh, the, and the son is simply obeying the instru instruction of his father. The landowner can't collect because anytime he sends someone to the tenants to pay, they attack. So there's really only one question left to ask. Why are the tenant farmers attacking? Why? It, it seems stupid, really. If you think about it, it seems like they're missing a really great opportunity, doesn't it? Like, they, they had this excellent vineyard. Everything's set up for them. They had the trust and the support of the vineyard owner to oversee operations. I mean, the relationship was good. Why did they do it? Why did they throw that away? Why did they decide to go to war against the owner? Well, here's why. The tenants attack because they want to be the owners. That's why. They're not content with a good living or a good setup, or an ideal plan for taking care of their family. They wanted the entire harvest for themselves. And anything that came on that land that reminded them that they weren't actually owners infuriated them. They burned. Now, before you get all high and mighty on me, let me tell you this, right? We all have a little evil farmer in us. <laughs> all of us. We all have this this greedy tenant inside of us just striving to be the owner. See, this isn't just a first century problem Jesus was addressing. This is a humanity problem. In fact, and he, he knows it. L look what God says to Israel after he brought them out of Egypt and into the promised land. So God literally opened the seas for them. He has done it all for them. Look at this. 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Do not forget the Lord, but fear the Lord your God and serve him only. So why does God point this out? Why? Why does God take time before he lets them walk into the promise to say, hey, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Because he knows that our tenancy, our hearts, don't want to be tenants. They want to be owners. Our hearts, they, they want to forget that everything that we have is a gift, right? And, and, and since we have nothing, and since he did it all and we have done nothing, we have no boast but in his provision. We have no boast but in his goodness. We have no boast but in his faithfulness. See, God knows our hearts, and he knows that they can be deceitful. He knows that you're going to forget that he hung the stars. Instead, you're going to get it caught up in naming the stars, thinking somehow you did something significant. God knows that you'll see his glory in creation. You'll grab an easel, a canvas, and you'll start stroking some paint on it like you participated in creating something beautiful when you did nothing. God knows that you'll see his most precious creation, man and woman, and instead of celebrating the one that made us different and beautiful and amazing together, he knows that we're going to grab that and say, I don't want to be a tenant, God, I'm an owner. Why can't men be women and women be men? Why, why be bound by these social constructs, huh? Oh, I don't know, because God created it and gave it order? Like, it's ridiculous. If Elon Musk tells you that your Tesla can't fly, are you going to drive it off the side of the Grand Canyon? No, because it wasn't designed to fly. It doesn't have wings. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Who says? The owner says. You're just a tenant. Stop acting like an owner. It's not yours. There are only two genders, folks. I don't... Clap at the end if you want to. Let me do this. I don't care how you dress up the language. There is female or woman, and there is male or man. That's it. It's just two. Just two. Who says? The owner, the founder, the creator. He says, and you're just a tenant. You're just visiting. There, look, listen to me. There is one baby aborted in this country every 97 seconds. I just want to let that sink in. Every 97 seconds, God formed that life. He breathed into it. They bear the image of the creator. Oh, but the tenants say, my body, my choice. No, no, you don't even get to be an owner over your own body. It was a gift to you. It's not yours. You didn't do it, and you certainly don't get to keep it when you're done with it. He did it. He holds it together. It's his. He gave you life. He sustains it. Stop trying to rob anyone. All you're doing is robbing yourself. Folks, we're talking about the condition of the human heart. It has fallen. It is broken. It has been destroyed. We're tenants, but we desperately want to be owners. Owners get to do what they want. They get to do what they want with the vineyard. They get to spend the profit how they want. I want to be an owner. See, the human heart struggles with the idea of creator God because if I'm created and everything that I have is a gift, then I owe him everything. But on the flip side, if I'm not created and everything is an accident, then I'm free to do what I want. I answer to no one. That's the problem. We know we're tenants. We just don't want to believe we are. We, we want to believe we're owners. Here's the most evil part of all, and this is what these evil farmers are doing. Even if I know I'm not an owner, I still enjoy pretending to be an owner. That's how evil we are. These tenants, they're evil, they're hostile, and everyone that shows up looking for fruit, everyone shows up that dares remind them that they're not, it infuriates them, and they take them out. Wow. 
back to the parable. They answer the question. They get the answer right. What, what, what would the landowner do to these tenants? Well, he will destroy the wicked men and bring in new tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. In fact, we know the application on this. We've seen it play out. This is no secret. Israel as a nation would be set aside temporarily and the good news that was for the nation of Israel first, remember, to the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek was given to non-Jews or Gentiles. Romans 1.6, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Man, salvation is good fruit, folks. Have you tasted it? Have you? It's available to everyone who believes. Call on the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will be saved. Trust him. Believe. Repent. Look at verse 42. Jesus said to him, said to them, said to the crowd, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Have you never read this? Jesus says. See, we've gone from the vineyard metaphor to now it's a stone. Well, here's why. Jesus is moving on from Isaiah 5, and now he's quoting Psalm 118, verse 22. And again, this would be immediately recognized by the crowd. Like if I were to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, where, where, where is this? John 3, 16. You immediately know it, immediately registers. Same thing's happening here. Jesus is showing the religious leaders that the rejected stone, as predicted by David, was the rejected son in the parable. So he's, he's bringing scripture into his parable saying the tenant farmers rejected the son as predicted the nation has rejected the chief cornerstone. This is crazy awesome. Like David predicts the stone being rejected. Jesus quotes David's prediction telling of his rejection. And then Peter in Acts 4 lays the foundation of the gospel on this same rejection. Peter's healing people in the name of Jesus. Everyone wants to know, Peter, how did you get your power? And look at what Peter says. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. When buildings were built back then, I, I don't know if you guys know this, I used to be a framer. I used to do like wood framing and stuff, right? When buildings were back, built back then, it wasn't a two by four attached to a concrete foundation. They used stone after stone after stone. That's why it's still standing today. And the cornerstone was the most important stone of all. Everything was aligned for stability and symmetry based on that single stone. And if that stone wasn't perfect, everything else was off. And so the builders had to pick the right one. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone was right there. It was right there, but they ignored it. It wasn't what they were looking for. Verse 43 Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. In other words, take a break for a sec. Okay, you're going to sit this one out. Israel, you're in a timeout. I have some work over here for the rest of the world that we got to do. We'll come back to you. This is a nice way of putting it, but in the parable just before, the language was not nearly as gentle. Look at what Jesus said to them. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Man, we, I, we're not as shocked these days when we read about tax collectors and prostitutes because the fall has kept falling, right? It's like, IRS in Vegas? What's the big deal? It's kind of what we, that's how we deal with this, right? But Jesus is not just pointing out the simple fact that prostitutes and tax collectors receive. Jesus is saying, look, the scum of the earth, the, the, the worst of the worst, they shout no to God, but then they repent, they do the Father's will, and they enter the kingdom of God. All the while, the religious leaders, they declare loudly, yes, God, come! 
But when he comes, they never humble themselves. They never obey him. Are you seeing it? His loudest supporters reject him. (laughs) And his loudest opponents receive him. Back to the stone metaphor, verse 44. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Listen to me, how you respond to Jesus is the most important thing about you. Nothing else matters. Not right now. Not until you do this. Your title, your career, your net worth, your reputation, your friends, your status, your health, your spouse, none of it. None of these things matter more than your response to Jesus. I remember hearing a lot about Jesus as a friend in church growing up. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to bash or anything. I just remember being given a lot of visuals of Jesus and I locking arms, skipping through the garden like we're starring in the sound of music together. You know what I mean? I don't recall very many times when I heard about people being broken to pieces and being crushed. But the truth is, those who do not know Jesus as deliverer will soon come to know him as destroyer. Like, Jesus is God's salvation. He's it. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's not, but listen, it's not just salvation that Jesus holds. It's also judgment. John 5 says, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. How you respond to Jesus is the most important thing about you. Look at this response. Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. They knew. They knew. They knew that they were the son in the parable before that never showed up. They knew that they were the evil farmers who wanted to be owners. They they knew that they were the builders that rejected the stone that would become the cornerstone. They knew that because they rejected Jesus, God would reject them and they would not enter into the kingdom of God. They knew. Contrast that to the response Peter got the day he preached the first gospel message. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. What do we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is a big difference between hearing Jesus and being convicted by him. There is a major difference in being cut to the heart and looking to arrest him. They hated the one pointing out their error more than they hated their error. And instead of looking to repent, they were looking for revenge. When given the choice of releasing Jesus or the insurrectionist Barabbas, they chose Barabbas. When Pilate asked what he should do with Jesus, they all answered, crucify him. Can we just marvel at God's patience here today in this story? I mean, they're rejecting him and he willingly dies for them? What? Can we marvel at God's love? He does not love us because we are worthy of love. He just loves us. So much so that he sent his son to die to save sinners. God's grace is the ultimate comfort. It is the ultimate reward. It is the ultimate rest. While I was still his enemy, God came and he cut open my heart and I could either fight back and look for a way to be an owner or I could fall on my knees and give him my life. While we were still his enemies, God sent his son. As we were rejecting him, he was making a way for us to know him. Yes, we should pause and marvel at him. His patience, his mercy, his love, his goodness, his faithfulness. We should spend time thinking about these things. But don't forget about his justice his righteous judgment and ultimately folks his inevitable victory 
I love Romans 16. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Under whose feet? <laughs> your feet. How cool is that? How encouraging is it to know that those who do not reject him actually get to join him as he ushers in forever peace in one final crushing blow. Satan will be defeated and we will reign with Jesus forever. So I need to ask you, do you love the Lord? I mean, do you love him? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, everything in you? Do you serve him? Do you know what he commands? Do you love his commands? Do you think about them? Do you seek to follow them and obey them are you content with him as an owner and you as a tenant listen to me I know Jesus Christ and I know he's returning one day I don't know, I don't know what day okay not a prediction coming but I do know that on that day I'm going to meet him in the sky and I really want to see you there I really want to see you there and the truth is simple. You will either reject yourself and live with him forever or you will reject him and live without him forever. He will give you the desire of your heart. And some of you are frustrated. You come in here frustrated today. God keeps sending you messengers pointing out that you're not the owner. Daily reminders in your life to prove that you don't own a thing. You're not in charge. You don't hold the keys. You're, you're dependent on him. You need him. In fact, even just seeing his servants walk through the vineyard infuriates you that none of it is yours. Today, my message for you is simple. Stop looking for ways to silence him. Instead of setting out to kill the messengers, you should set out to kill your pride. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what do I have to offer you but, but my gratitude? It seems nothing is really worth talking about but reminding myself what you've done for me. It's all I can think about. Lord, thank you for fixing my heart because I I was an evil farmer. And I know I still have that little evil farmer in me. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide me, that you would help me navigate that and give me the strength and the courage and the power to overcome those desires to want to be an owner and instead just turn that to praise and worship. Lord, that you would save me from that kind of pressure, that kind of responsibility. I don't want to be an owner. Lord, I just want to sit here and watch and marvel at who you are. I love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.